This is, this is CG Talks, the podcast where CG guys talk about CG. This podcast is powered by GarageFarm.net, a place where 3D cloud rendering is incredibly fast and cheap. Today, I'm very honored to have with me uh, my guest, Mr. Federico Bianculo, Arcvis artist, founder and creative director of The Big Picture, an Arcvis studio based in Bologna, Italy, but also a podcaster, host of There's Something About Arcvis podcast, and privately also a pop culture geek, a fan of tabletop role-playing games. Am I correct? You made your research, I see. <laughs> yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Federico Bianculo. Thank you, DJ. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, the first, the first uh, to kick off the conversation, maybe let's uh, dive into a first topic I wanted to discuss with you. Uh, and indeed, this is a po- this is a topic that you brought up uh, when we were pre- preparing to record this uh, this podcast episode. So um, the topic is mental health, and uh, particular me- particularly mental health in the post pandemic Arcvis industry. And uh, the subject is delicate, but I believe it's mm-hmm. uh, is more important now than ever before in the post pandemic reality. Not to mention the economic crisis or war in Ukraine or everything that's going on in the world right now. So do you think that the Arvis people were were like particularly severely impacted by the last few years of this crisis and uncertainty? Well, let's try to define what Arvis, Arvis people is. Generally, Arvis people are sensitive, sensitive people. We fall, even though we can debate whether Arvis is art or not. I think Arvis falls into some kind of creative profession. So generally creative professionals are more sensitive. And I think that this is backed by studies, by the way, it's not something that I'm coming up with. Uh, and I think that these kind of people are, have been more severely affected by the pandemic, the current situation. We, it, it's okay to feel down, to feel stressed and to feel bad about what's, what's happening in the world and what has happened before the pandemic. However, I tried to make a point because that's interesting that we brought up this topic. It's something that I'm trying to make aware the community of, of uh, you know, of the existence of this problem, which I think it's, it, it, it dates before the pandemic. Uh, our industry is, um, high, I think it's a high stress in, industry in any way you put it, even though we are not medical, t- medical caregivers or, you know, people on the front line of health. Uh, so our work, our job line is not essential to the world, let's, let's face it. However, it can still get very stressful. And I try to understand also under the light of, uh, of what I've been through in my life, uh, why we feel like that and if there's any way to avoid that. I think the pandemic has done, has acted as a catalyst for all of these things, you know, all the lockdowns, staying home, being worried for one's own future, not knowing what was going to happen, what, how the world would have looked like from, you know, from there 2022 in two, three years. Yeah, that has been definitely a catalyst for something that was there before the pandemic happened. So you see, DJ, Arcvis, mm-hmm. as I mentioned, comes, stems from architecture. Architecture is a very stressful industry. There's, I think, a in some kind of environment, some kind of universities, also some kind of offices, there's a sick work culture. And we narrate this work culture in our job line. Luckily, there's people, I know a lot of people, a lot of offices that try to preserve the mental health and the well-being of their artists. There's people that do not. We have to, you know, let, let's face the truth. There's people in the industry that do not care about the well-being of their artists. I, I've seen and heard horror stories, even from big firms, big names. Won't mention any name, of course, but I know there's, there's situations going on in the industry. And I think this has going this has to change even under the light of what's happening in the world, you know, all this great resignation stuff. I probably you've overheard of people resigning their jobs, mm-hmm. especially yes. in the U S uh, I think Arvis is going there. Eventually people are going to be fed up of this way of handling deadlines of handling projects that everything has to be done at the last minute without a clear organization, uh, eventually going to get there. This industry, if it's, if you don't act quickly about this issue, it's going to chew people and spit them up. So mm-hmm. I think we definitely have to make people aware of this, that you can go 
far until a certain point you cannot just burn yourself out each project you have to take breaks the occasional deadline is fine but it's not the way this should not should not be the standard way to work of course i'm not saying that there's people that that all people should not work like that there's people that i know people that are fine working 20 no, not 20 it's too much 14 12 hours per day and they're fine they're fresh as a rose i will not be but in general, as a general rule, people should be wary of working like that for too long because eventually it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back to them on their health, on their life. Even more so because we have only one life and we cannot just spend all of our time working, you know. We have to enjoy our life. Or even the yeah. things, you know, the small time we have with our, with our beloved ones, with our dear ones, if we have a funny, you know, a hobby. You are mentioning to- tabletop games. That has helped me a lot in trying to rebalance my life. So now it's a big part of my life. Um, so something that breaks up the routine, you know, you cannot just do this is this works for me. You cannot just work for three months, 12 hours per day and then take a two weeks break. It doesn't work, at least for me. There may be mm-hmm. people that work like that, but that's not for me. And I think, I think most of I think most of the people, yeah. I think if if someone works like that, like there are particular individuals that are kind of seem to handle that well but i think it's like for some period of time and then they probably yeah. hit a wall at the end like i think i think about i don't know kanye west like people with i think he mm. had like uh kind of like a bipolar disease or something or so, something like that yeah so that's that's kind of like working that's where, that's where more full, yeah, full steam for some yeah, time yeah. and then falling into some kind of a rut I, I think Kanye's, Kanye's, uh, Kanye's situation is much different. Bipolar disorder, disorder is something very serious that doesn't have much to do with burnout. Uh, burnout is something that happens when, you know, you stress a lot about work and you go through a cycle of stages that characterize burnout and then you can eventually hit depression and uh, anxiety. So in this case, in the case of burnout, depression and anxiety so this are kind of symptoms of overworking. Kanye's where Kanye West's case is is much more severe. He he was like that since you know, he has been like that since I don't know how much how long. But bipolar disease is something that is more serious and completely detached. So that's important mm-hmm. for me to say because we have yeah. to make you know a clear distinction between mental illnesses and conditions. Um, and I saw this kind of confusion even in our industry when there were attempts of trying to you know investigate the conditions the condition the mental health condition of our industry i saw some confusion about you know disorders and conditions so i tried it i, I tried to, to act i wanted to intervene to make this clarification because i think that's important not to con- confuse mental illnesses with conditions that led lead to mental illnesses which is the burnout mm-hmm. i know it sounds a bit complicated but i think it's important also to discuss this with some kind of expert you know mm-hmm. yeah that's we are we're kind of like all uh, not, not professionals in that area but yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 well i think both cases may happen but i think the the, the condition thing you mentioned is like a more broad topic and it, it kind of like affects all of us not just some of us uh, so um I'm thinking this is also relating to to how the pandemic uh, impacted our way of working, like the uh, mm. the emergence of of working online or like remote work. It it was like probably beneficial for some people, and some some people find found this really hard, like to manage. Uh, I was lucky. I was the lucky one who who kind of started working this way just before the pandemic. When I started working for Garage mm-hmm. Farm, when we uh, yeah, we we kind of implemented this kind of remote work system uh, before, so we were kind of prepared. But most companies were kind of like hit by this uh, from like by surprise. And how did your company uh, manage this situation? Did you have like some solutions for that? Or how 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 well, did you? To be honest, this? I yeah yeah. To be honest, I'm in a similar situation as you. I mean, before the pandemic, my beginnings were like the beginnings of many others in the industry. I was working at home. I I have an, an office set up at home, probably like you have. Uh, and 2020 would have been the year of the leap, you know. So trying to get an office, try to get people aboard permanently in the office. So and then the pandemic happened. So I had to rethink my plans and everything that I did in the past. So the work that I did to work from home 
it was 2017, 18, 19, so three years of working from home, they stayed there. So the way that I worked uh, hasn't changed. Um, these days, I'm actually doing less images, but I'm doing more online content geared toward geared toward artists and education concerning artists. So um, I changed my plans in time. I didn't feel anymore the need to have a physical office, so I decided to stay home. And I don't have any particular tip for people who want to you know set up their own home office. But the one tip that I can give to them is just try to get a separate space from your own, you know, your everyday life space. Otherwise everything gets confused and you don't, and you, you end up not knowing anymore where's workspace and where's leisure space. It's important to have this distinction in your mind, again, to avoid this kind of, of burnout situations in which you don't disconnect from your work. It's very important to disconnect, to have your own, not just space, but also your own time for work if possible. What I saw um, from people that made transition from working in an office to the working from home is that they started working even more than before. They started working more than they were working at the office. And that's quite serious. And that reconnects very well with what you said before. The pandemic has forced people, well, not forced, but has led people to work even more than before. Because you know, you don't have boundaries anymore. Um, that's probably the most difficult part of what happened. People didn't have any boundaries anymore, but not just artists, even team managers. So it's important not just for artists to create boundaries, but also for team managers to understand that they have to respect those boundaries, that they don't just call people any time of the day just because they're home, you know. Uh, so this this is one thing. And another thing, yeah, it's uh, the space, as I told you, and also the quality of the space, I would say. Just try to make the space your own with people that you, people, well, not people, but you cannot, but with things, objects, furniture that you like, plants, uh, objects, you know, kind of any anything that you would maybe things that you brought from a travel of yours a piece of furniture that you like a lot so just try to make this space your own so these two tips are have been quite useful for me actually so once i started embellishing my space with plants in my case i think my condition in my office my own office has improved a lot for example so don't don't underestimate these things Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I really love what you said about uh, keeping the boundaries. Uh, I found myself uh, um, trying to implement at least this uh, approach when I, at least working with a computer is is like a tricky one because, yeah, in some, uh, I found like some offices are uh, tend to work kind of like an eight, uh, eight hour shift and just like sitting in front of a computer with maybe like very short breaks. I find myself, if I'm doing this way, uh, sometimes I do. And this is really like exhausting. It's um, just the, the, the whole thing. Uh, like during the pandemic, I've, for example, I've bought a regulated desk like to, to be standing and uh, sitting at the, during the day, I'm, I'm changing the position, position and it makes a huge impact. And also like making the breaks, uh, sometimes, you know, making a, like a 15 minute break and just uh, taking a walk, it just makes, uh, makes the work. I'm getting back to the work mm -hmm. with a new approach, with a fresh mind, with, um, sometimes with new ideas that kind of like crunching this way, like pushing harder, uh, it's, it just doesn't work the, uh, as efficiently even. It's, it's kind of like a way of efficiently working in a longer period of time. And I'm thinking this is like, it's strange that we don't learn that even from nature, kind of like if, if we see our, our heart muscle that works throughout the whole lifespan, right? It's, it makes like a mm -hmm. concussion and then it's, it's making a break, right? Every time it beats, it's, this is like a nat natural rhythm, right? A day and night, you, you sleep and then you work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, everything needs uh, a rhythm. That's very useful what you said. The breaks are very important. Uh, it's something that has been you know, proved by science. You should actually try to pause your work with some short intervals, like, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 minutes, as you said. That's very important for sure. And also, yeah, the position is can help certain people. For example, I bought a rocking chair, you know, the, the kneeling chair, the, the stocky barrier. That's mm -hmm. the first purchase I made when I set up my own office. Also, you know, for postural reasons. Uh, now I'm not sitting on that chair because I want to stay still, but when I work, I use that one so I can, you know, change my posture. I, I can stay active. I don't, I don't, I don't freeze in one, in one position. And it's also good for your, for your back, your, your spine, your yeah. back muscles and whatsoever. So that's, that's a purchase to, you know, to consider not a rocking chair, a kneeling chair is not for everyone, but 
it can give a lot of health benefits. It's not yeah. it's not good for very tall people, for example. Yeah, exactly. Like I've seen uh, this is this kind of falls in the I, the whole topic of ergonomics of working. And right now we're kind of yeah, like yeah, doing yeah. doing something that's very unnatural for a human being. Uh, I think we were talk, taught that in our uh, university where. where the, the professor that was teaching ergonomics, he, he he said that like human body is like is created for movement. Like we are we are kind of like designed to be in motion, and right now we're kind of putting ourselves in front of a machine and just set, st standing still. And even if even those like those um, super comfy chairs, they they tend to to make us not move. Right? It's, it's very unhealthy. Like yeah. Yeah. We are, we are, yeah, we are creatures that are. That, that's an interesting. That's an inter That's a very interesting point. I think it makes me think also how we, how we manage anxiety. You know, anxiety is a reaction that is a very ancient reaction. Anxiety in the ancient times was triggered when we, you know, to avoid dangers, to avoid being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or by stomped by some kind of mammoth. You know, our ancestors, you know, felt anxiety to avoid dangers. Now the dangers are almost gone, you know? So we feel anxiety when we, you know, when we don't receive feedback from our clients or when the client sends us, send, sends us you know, remarks that we don't like, or we, we, we feel we cannot manage. So the whole anxiety mechanism as you know, is messed up now, if you think about it. So this, uh, to go back on the not natural topic, mm -hmm. This is very emblematic, and this is something that is very present in our society, not just in ArcBIS, but in the society in general. Anxiety is a, is a really, really big thing right now. So mm -hmm. this kind of reconnecting with what's important to try to put things in perspective, I think it's very, it's very important. For ArcBIS artists, even more so, as I mentioned at the beginning, what we do is not essential. It's not a matter of life and death. If the client doesn't see the tree, the leaves of the tree or the, you know, the stones of the paving like they want, if you don't manage to do it, it's not a big deal. It's like, okay, guys, I mean, yeah. it's not a big deal. Who's going to be, who's going to see but, that stone on the paving? But, but we, we're sometimes like uh, treating this as it was a matter of life and death because it's somehow, somehow it is because if we don't get the job, we don't get the money, we don't. Yeah, we don't get the means to to survive, right? So, so this so we kind of like maybe overestimate every single little detail that gets into that, and we treat yeah, yeah. it as it we was go like very anxious for this reason. But at garagefarm.net, you'll find many 3D rendering solutions. Use coupon codes visible on your social media channels during registration to boost your account up to a hundred dollars of free render credits and check how quick and life saving 3D cloud rendering is. No, no, I mean, we go very anxious exactly for the reason that you told me, DJ, but if you think about it, the client is not, it's not like it's not going to come back. It's not going to come back for the leaves on the trees or the, the, the paving, you know, those are not the reasons for, for which a client doesn't come back. Mm -hmm. Usually when a client doesn't come back, something more serious has happened. I can tell you that from experience. It's not like you don't, you haven't, you know, amended a remark or a small remark. There's something else, uh, and we should not stress too much about these kind of things. We should put things in perspective. Of course, if you want to give a good service to your clients, you do what they ask you. But if you cannot, if you cannot, because there's a time limit or a constraint, don't don't stress about it. It's not a matter of being stressed on these things, you know. Yeah, and it's, it's I think it brings up like uh, the whole uh, the whole thing that the the. Client relationship is is like a relationship between people, and I think this is like also a big issue with the pandemic when we were kind of locked down, and also with with the online working where we kind of yeah tend to meet just with the Zoom meetings or not a face to face meeting, which involves so many like little details that we don't even mm. we are not even aware of that they are important in kind of like social interactions, and right now when we were so long like deprived of this. It also affects our you know, mental mental wellness because this is not the way that we are used to interact totally, with people. Totally, 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 absolutely. Uh, the whole body language, the paraverbal language, are so important in communication. But for, since the beginning, from the acquisition phase and from the management phase, you have to see what your you know counterpart is thinking, and you can read that from body language behind the screen. You cannot read it. 
think if you don't even have the video, I've been in calls where the people didn't even have the video, so you cannot read at all what was going to happen, what was happening in the meeting room. So that's a very difficult thing that all of us have, have, come, through, have come through, not just, of course, not just Arvis artists, but in general, Arvis artists who want to manage their own client in a proper way had to deal with this. And the whole missing part of the, of the body language, uh, something that is damaging the way that we do business, I think. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was looking like online recently, there's kind of like another threat on the on the horizon for for some artists. Like at least some of some of people uh, are considering this as a, as a threat. Others are and excited about this because it's a, like a change coming. And I mean mm -hmm. the the artificial intelligence and the the new tools that are kind of like. The, the hot topic right now, uh, the mid journey and uh, Dali and uh, the, this kind of image generation um, things, uh, and some people see that like it's it's something that is coming to replace our like our jobs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, others are seeing this more like an, another tool that's going to just like change our workflows. Um, I, I just wondered what's your opinion on that? Like, how do you see that and? In, especially in the art industry, industry. Uh, do you see that as something like that will replace us or, or just change our focus? I think it's a, it's a great topic. It's a topic of the moment. And I've been lucky enough. I think it's a great thing that we waited to do this interview because I, in the meantime, I managed to get access not only to Midjourney, but also to Dali. So I had the time to test both in these days. Not for art, please, I have to admit, I just played with you know, concept art and character art, so portraits, and I was blown away by the results. So as for art, please, uh, I'm quite optimistic about it for, us, for several reasons, actually. I don't think AI is going to replace art artists anytime soon. Well, probably as it, as it is right now, probably things will change in a few years, and I don't know how, how this is going to develop, but as of it is right now, it is a very powerful tool to do research, to do concept research. So I can really see myself uh, in my workflow, especially trying to get some ideas from AI, from a text prompt, and just try to explore that direction in a 3D. But as it is right now, I don't think, and I think this is going to be like that for a few years at least, uh, AI is not going to replace the Arcvis artist job because Arcvis, an Arcvis image or animation is such a bespoke product. With so many details, you see, you know how architects work, how they want things perfectly done, how some, some of them, they're also control freaks. And the AI doesn't give yet that degree of control that our clients want. So there still has to be someone behind that, you know, manages the whole aspect. And even then, even when the, the AI will be powerful enough to give control on this aspect, there will still be the need to somebody that knows how to, you know, deal with those aspects, how to move the prompts in order to get that result. Right now, the AI is not good enough to give a finish, a finished it product. It will be, probably it will be for sure. And the artist profession is going to change as it has changed in the years before us. You know, DJ, artist was supposed to finish a lot of times so far. With SketchUp, should have been the end of the modeling 2D people because SketchUp was so easy that it was supposed to put out of business modelers, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Escape into motion that are supposed to take away the artist because now it is so easy for architects to do images in house. But the point is that Enscape into emotions, uh, emotion are tools that are used in another way. Artists, artists are still very relevant when it comes to high end and to final presentation. So those are tools for previews, something else. Uh, what else? Corona render and the simplification of VRA that happened in 2015. So all these things, all these steps, there was somebody that was telling, yeah, Arvis is going to finish. We're still here. So mm -hmm. I think this is still the case. Yeah. We're still, we're going to still be here. We're going to still be relevant. Probably things will change in the way we work, in our workflow. I definitely see AI taking place, a, a huge part in our workflow. But honestly, Arvis is not going anywhere. I think Arvis artists are not going anywhere. So I think we should really calm down, test the tools, understand how we can implement it in our workflow and try to make the best out of what, what is offered to us. I tried, as I mentioned, Mid Journey and Dali, both for other things that are not Arvis. I tried the lead architecture, just a little. Mm -hmm. um, and I can confirm you, it's a great tool for concepting to, 
to get ideas for a mood, for lighting, uh, to get quick iterations. I think it's going to, you know, I think it's going to enhance a lot the quality of the work and the quality of the work was already very high. Uh, there's a lot of firms that do a great job doing images nowadays to the point that I think it doesn't make sense anymore to compete on the quality of the images that we do. Unless, of course, unless you're one of those films like Mir, for example. Of course, I always do the example of Mir because they were the first, the first ones to do images in a certain way, and they they keep innovating nowadays. So they're not they still renew their work every day. So if you're not that kind of firm, you cannot compete on the quality of your service. You have to compete on something else. Whether it's the way that you relate with your client, it's the way that you you know you may add supplemental services to your core offer. But I think it doesn't make sense anymore to compete on the quality of your of your images. But probably that's, that's I'm going a bit off topic on this. Uh, the point is that AI probably is going to play a role in our workflow. Um, probably the more radical of us could say, no, I don't want to use AI because I don't want to feed my data. I don't, I don't want to help to improve the AI. We could make another point for that. And another mm -hmm. really interesting point that I, that I, well, there's two interesting points that I want to touch on AI. Uh, one is the point of copyright. Who, who is the owner of the images? Who is the author of the images? Which are the two different things. And the other thing is the the art question. Now, I well, I, I have the opinion that art is, is not art. It's my own personal opinion. It doesn't mean that it's right. Many people can say that art is a form of art. For me, it is not because it's a service based industry. But in general, can the AI images be considered art? So that's a really interesting topic. And the other interesting thing is the copyright, as I was mentioning. So the copyright of the images, I think it's uh, it's very clear. Uh, it belongs to the um, to the developers of the AI because there's terms and conditions unless it's otherwise marked down, otherwise established in the legal terms. The copyright of the images, well, it belongs usually to the company of the AI. But in general, who's the author? Is the AI or the human? I think this is the most inter interesting point. Uh, I trace mm -hmm. this back, you know, to the difference between traditional painting and uh, and computer generated images. So mm -hmm. if you put a traditional pain. painter, if you were to put a traditional, no, if you want to say something, colleges, yeah. yeah. maybe maybe also colleges, yeah, yeah. Some, sometimes you know all the modern art like. Even like the invention of photography, even you know, it's it's kind of like similar because it's it kind of allowed for uh, replicating the world in a kind of mechanical way, and it it, it yeah. might have been you know perceived yeah. as something that will kill traditional painting. It, it really just like introduced new ways of handling reality, like depicting reality, and so many new forms of art like emerged out of this. Yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly my point, DJ. You 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 nailed it, and. I was mentioning, I was making the example of the traditional painters because it's uh, something that is more close to my own reality and my own my own personal experience. If a traditional painter was to where to see, like, take a Picasso or a Rembrandt or a Cezanne, no, one of these people where to see how we make images in our industry, they will definitely say, yeah, this is this is not your image. You didn't do this. The computer did it. Now, I don't think today anybody will say that the computer did the image. We are the author of the image. I think the same is going to happen with the AI. Now, probably 99.9% .9 of the people will say, yeah, but the AI did the image, you didn't do the image. But probably in a few years, we'll start shifting this perspective and we'll see the you know uh, job professions, professions like professionals, not job professions, but mm, roles like AI prompt artists. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have authors that just input their prompts and that he shot an image through the AI. So it's just a matter of perspective. It's how the times change. So right now, we think that the author is the AI, probably in 10 years, we'll say, no, the author is the prompt artist. So the art is always, you know, the, the kind, this is the perspective shift that happened in the, um, in the nine, no, in the nineties, but in the, in the 20th century with the ready-made Marcel Duchamp. This is more about the, uh, the art part. So Marcel Duchamp just came up with putting mustache on the, on the Mona Lisa. Now today we, we say that that's art, but there's no technical gesture on that. There's just concept, you know? So 
that's a complex issue about art. We can say that right now AI is not art, but if somebody was to you know put a concept behind art, art made by AI, who can say that that is not art? That's mm -hmm. a complex issue, but it's a bit out of our case. But there's a lot of interesting topics that AI opens to us and to future, to future artists as well. So it's very important that we take them into consideration. This podcast is powered by garagefarm.net. Visit our webpage and check out our rendering solutions. Feel free to ask us about anything you need. Our service provides 24-7 tech support. Yeah, I really like what you said about uh, Arvis not being art because it's a service-based uh, uh, thing. And also so the question of being an author, like we might also think that we are not the author because the author of, you know, of the architecture is the architect. And there, there are a lot of like ingredients in that. And I think it's not like, like that new in art because if you look back, for example, in, uh, in the painting history, there, there were like painters like, Rubens, which, uh, you know, they, they, they had kind of like a whole factory of, of paintings and there, are, there were people yeah, yeah, painting, yeah. painting for him and he was just like a director. Right now, it's even in the movies, right? You, you just consider the director like the main man of like running the, the whole thing, but it's like a team of people. So it kind, kind of comes down to like this being a society thing. Like I think we are a little bit obsessed by individualism right now that, that someone like is the author of the work. And mm. in some way, art is like a community thing. It's also like a, uh, like uh, our, our common good, right? And the, the, I think that that kind of maybe falls into the mental health issue that we're talking about. It's, it's all about mm, our lot, community yeah. as well, right? It's not just like about- A lot, a lot, yes ourselves as individuals but how we how we like manage our social interactions as well definitely it's uh art the art thing well the perception of ourselves as artists is something that is very impactful in mental health i just want to just make a step back and clarify what i said before yeah i don't think art is art but it's an industry it's a profession that uses the tools that come from art so in order to craft a good image you have to follow the rules of art so in a certain sense, we use the tools that we use in art to create our work, but it's not an expression, you know, it's, I don't think it's an artistic expression. Of course, some pieces of art can be artistic expression in certain cases, in some elite cases, but probably most of the art piece we do is not art. It's not intended as art, it's intended as a marketing product. So. And for the art part, yes, that's, uh, that's very important, uh, the point that you made. We perceive ourselves as artists, but just because, well, mostly because the industry calls us artists. There's also a linguistical aspect in this. Now, you, you may were mentioning the cinema and I mentioned the video game industry. I want to talk about that. There's a lot of artists. There's the cinematic artists, concept artists, environment artists. There's a lot of artists in the, in the CG industry, uh, but the artist uh, name is just a convention that we use to, you know, to pinpoint people that do this kind of creative job, this kind of creative work. It's not like we do art, it's just a convention. So I think there's some misunderstanding in this case. So we call ourselves 3D artists, art artists, artists. Okay, that's fine, but be aware that the artist name is just a convention. It's not like we are doing art. So uh, I think we have to clarify this. And this is where many people fall, where they have the, the artist syndrome, you know? Some of them, yeah, some people in the industry, they're definitely artists, they, but these people are the people that went out the traditional art biz and they started doing their own things, NFTs, personal projects, uh, side activities. Those people, I'm very happy to call them artists because they also, you know, art is also very subjective. Art is not something that we recognize, but other people recognize as art. The, you know, again, the, the Duchamp thing. Somebody decided that Duchamp's work was art, but somebody else did. Somebody else uh, they recognized that as art and established that Duchamp's work is art. We cannot say ourselves that our work is art, you know. So it's a, it's a really huge topic. And this is, I was mentioning before the, the, you were mentioning actually before the mental health issues that this is where many people in our industry fall. We have the artist complex and we're very fragile and prone to confrontation, but we should not be, uh, this is a bit more outside of the art, you know, the art discourse, but we should not be because everybody, 
all of us come from different experiences. We have different, you know, life choices. We made different life choices. Uh, this is something that has took me a long time to accept that my work was not on par with other people. But after all, I was just my own. I was just a one, a one person doing images for architecture. I will not, I, I cannot reach the quality levels of a team working closely knitted, knitted together every day and doing great stuff. Unless I start working for a team regularly, probably possi possibly in person, not remotely, I don't think I will reach some kind of quality level. Even though personally, I think my work is good enough to be client, good client work, to be uh, really useful to my clients. And it's, a, it's good work. Probably it's not top tier work like those high-end firms, but I think it's good enough to be marketable, honestly. And I'm, go I'm good with that because this is my choice. This is my life choices. It's, it's a product of my life choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's like for someone, someone else to judge, like sometimes we, we tend, tend to, yeah, to compare ourselves uh, in a very, very severe way. Like, uh, um, yeah, because we have access to all the, all the high end, high end industry products, we tend, tend to like use it as a benchmark. And this is really like a top of the tops and not like mm. the average, right? So that's, yeah, that's, I think something that might also cause anxiety and stuff like that. But yeah, there's, there's a place for, for everyone probably if you just, um, yeah, don't, don't stay like in your small bubble, just go outside and interact with people, with clients and yeah, the market in general it's like all people it's not it's not like something something so super abstract yeah it's, i think there's, there's a space for any kind of oh yes i think there's uh, there's a lot of space for people in the market there's there's different kinds of requests from the market and you can position yourself in many different ways you don't you don't need to aim that as a benchmark as you said before it's, it's a really important point, the one that you made. We set our benchmarks very high, but it is not necessary all the time, you know? This is the end of the first part of our conversation with Federico Brancullo from The Big Picture. And in the next ones, we will talk about differentiating yourself in the ArcVis industry, like the selling points, uh, what you really sell to the client, and then uh, there will be another one where we, where we talk about being a generalist or trying different hats and dealing with different, um, different stuff in the ArcVis or any other industry that's related. So stay tuned um, and make sure you don't miss uh, the upcoming episodes with Federico Bencullo.